so thankful for each of you to have taken time to come today on a cold day. Certainly appreciate your presence and your participation in the Lord's work and His service here. I want to encourage you to be respectful of those around you. Let's sit up straight. Let's listen carefully. Let's please don't talk to one another. Let anyone talk to you wherever you are in another tour. If you talk to somebody, you'll distract someone around you. Let's not do that. If we can, please put away our phones or texting. And let's get our Bibles out to Colossians chapter number 3. How thankful I am for the Word of God. The Bible is given to us for two reasons. To show us, number one, how to get to heaven from here. Number two, how to live after we know we're going to heaven. And certainly, if you're here today, you're not sure. If you were to die, you'd go to heaven. That is life's most important question to get answered. I remember years ago as someone confronted me with that question. They said, John, do you know for sure if you died today, you'd go to heaven? Or do you have some doubt about that? I had doubt. I wasn't sure if I were to die, I'd go to heaven. Thank God I found that out that night. That night, someone loved me enough to take a Bible and to show me from the Bible what God's plan was for me to have eternal life. I was in trouble with God. I realized that. I knew I was a sinner. Sinners deserve to go to the lake of fire, was to be separated from God forever. I believed that Jesus died, he was buried and rose again, but I had never personally accepted his gift of eternal life. That was a great day for me. Maybe you're like that today. You have came and you've come to church and you've stopped what you're doing. You've got enough clothes on to come here to the service. You have gotten enough fuel in your vehicle to get here to the location that you're here. But you're not sure. If you were to die, you'd go to heaven. Please don't leave before letting someone explain that to you. Let someone take the Word of God and show you from the Bible how you can know for sure when life's over, you'll go to heaven. It's the greatest day of one's life. It determines your eternal destiny. And certainly you want to know that. And I want you to know it as well. And I hope that you'll be thinking about that this morning. However, most of our preaching and teaching in a church like this is for people who have already accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. That's the only way really the Bible makes sense. You've got to have antennas to understand it. It's a spiritual book. Just like there are many uh, frequencies operating right now in this room that I cannot discern. The reason is I don't have a built-in antenna. <laughs> if we had an antenna, we brought a little transistor radio, we could turn it on and start turning the knob there, and it would suck those sounds and those frequencies right out of the air and tell us what they're saying. Because the radio has something I don't have. It doesn't have, I don't have an antenna. I don't have the ability to do that. And the same is true with someone who's truly God's child. That means they have the Holy Spirit of God inside of them. It is that spiritual antenna that discerns spiritual things. And uh, if you're saved, I hope that you're tuned into His frequency today. I hope that your heart is ready to receive what God has for us in His Word. I would like to say just to all of you who are in discipleship, thank you so much for taking the time and the effort uh, and the energy to get to the location. The location is right over here to my right in the West Overflow Room. And uh, right over here on Sunday morning at 9.30. On Sunday afternoon at 5. On Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. And we've had scores of our people today. What a wonderful group of folks that were there at 9.30 this morning. Just interested in the Word of God. New Christians who have just been saved in the last few weeks and months. And uh, then some other folks who are helping them grow in the Lord and learning more about the things of God. Tonight at 5 o'clock again, the same time, the opportunity for you to be there. I hope that you will be in your place and learning what the Bible says. I believe everybody ought to know what the Bible says about salvation, eternal security, uh, what the Bible says about baptism. Why do we get baptized? Do you need to get baptized to go to heaven? No, you don't. Well, why do we do it? What's the purpose of that? What does the Bible say about that? And then the wonderful Word of God. And then once you finish those four lessons, if you want, you can go uh, the customized way through the uh, next eight lessons of Scripture and let, let next eight doctrines with another Christian in our church. And we'd like to encourage you to make sure you do that. I believe it will help you. It will help us grow together. The Bible's commanded us to grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to be a part of a growing organism of First Baptist Church of Hammond because it is the body of Christ. And I want to grow together with you. Colossians chapter 3. The book of Colossians is one book of 66 books that God put in our Bible. He selected the books. It's an amazing Bible written over a period of 1,600 years with 40 different human instruments 
uh, one author, the Holy Spirit of God. The Bible tells us the Word of God did not come in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. One author, the Holy Spirit of God, many different ink pens, 40 at least different authors. 39 of the books were written in the Old Testament before Jesus came. 27 were written after Jesus went back to heaven in the New Testament. The whole Bible tells us how sinners like us can be reconciled with a God who's not a sinner. How we can live together with Him. It is a book of reconciliation of people like us who have sinned against a God who's holy. But His plan of redemption, how we can live together. The main character of the Bible is Jesus Christ. Though you may not see Him in name, you can see Him in types and shadows throughout the, New, the Old Testament. And then see Him referenced hundreds and thousands of times in the New Testament. He is the key character of the Bible because He's the way, He's the truth, and He's the life. No man come to the Father. You and I will not be the exception except through Jesus Christ. Every road of life leads to God. It doesn't matter what your religious paradigm is, how you think, what your perspective is, what you believe in. You can believe God's a doorknob if you want to knock yourself out. But it's not... The God is the God of the Bible, and every road of life leads to God, but only one road leads to eternal life, and that's the person of Jesus Christ. He's the way, He's the truth, He's the life, He's the God-man. He's the one who formed the world as we know it. He's our creator, and yet He is our redeemer. He made us and bought us back. Jesus was separated from God the Father, so you and I would not have to be separated from Him. What a wonderful, wonderful person. Well, the book of Colossians was written to a group of people who believed Jesus Christ, just like you and I do, it was a church, the church of Colossae. Now, Apostle Paul had probably not been there. In chapter 1 and verse number 4, in chapter 2 and verse number 1, it is obvious that he had heard of their faith, but he had not been to their place. He had no doubt led a man to Christ, maybe Epaphras who had gotten saved in the church at Ephesus and about 100 miles away was the church or the city of Colossae. And Epaphras possibly went to Colossae and began sharing the gospel of Christ and now there was a group of believers. But they had a problem. They had put their faith in Jesus Christ but they had allowed Jesus to go from preeminent and personable and their, their prized possession to really off the radar altogether. Jesus had not even come across their mind's eye. They had made the great Savior really with a little s. They had not even thought of Him. He had gone away. They had been stolen. The, the love they had for Christ had been substituted for traditions, for the rudiments of the world, through philosophies, and not after the person of Jesus Christ. You know, that happens to me sometimes too. And that happens to you. We get busy with doing things and buying and selling and going there and watching ball games and, and taking care of kids and paying bills and, and doing all the things we do and shoveling snow and shoveling more snow and doing all kinds of things that really are necessary and good and not all bad, but where Jesus comes off the radar altogether. He doesn't even come to our mind's eye. We can come to church and not think about Jesus. We can write the tithe check and a check for missions, and Jesus does not come to our mind's eye. We can sing beautiful songs of congregation or even specials or choir numbers, and we can play instruments in the orchestra, and we can push buttons on the flight deck, and we can put on our usher jacket and welcome people to the service and assist them in finding seats and, and give out visitor uh, cards and things, and Jesus doesn't even come to our mind's eye. Well, that was the problem, Colossae. Jesus had become very small, and he needs to be the head. He needs to be the preeminent one. He needs to be the motivation. Listen, if Jesus is your motivation, you're going to do just fine. When difficult times come, you can realize, you know what, this is about what Jesus wants, not about me. When Jesus is paramount in our marriages, a husband over here, a wife over here, and they work toward Jesus, they naturally become closer to each other. When Jesus is paramount, it doesn't matter. I'll come to Sunday school because it's about Jesus. 
I don't come to church because of you. You should not come because of me. We come because of Christ. I don't give because of you. You don't give because of me. We give because of Christ. I don't keep gospel tracts in my pocket because of you. I do so because of Jesus. And I, I share them about because I talk about things I love. That's sometimes why I do not talk about Jesus. Well, the church of Colossae was having those issues, just like me and just like you. And Apostle Paul challenges them, and we'll not go through the whole book and all God's people said, Amen. Would you like to go home and eat today sometime? But for a few verses, let's look at chapter 3 and verse number 1 as we speak about building a good family. Ingredients in godly families. And that means, I think, in your own personal family, but also in the family of God. There are some ingredients that we want to apply to our hearts and lives, but let's see a little background, if we can, first in chapter 3 and verse number 1. He says then, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. If I'm going to... Add the necessary elements to make a good family. I don't know about you, but I enjoy family. I enjoy my brothers, my mom, my dad. I enjoy my children and my wife. I enjoy extended family. We had tonight, last night some folks who are from Jacksonville living in, and, and they, they, they live in Jacksonville, but they stayed with us overnight and we enjoyed having them. It was like having extended family. Now, they're Filipino and we're white boys. But we feel like connected to them. We love them. They're, they're part of our family because we all know Jesus. And there's a connection there. We love being together with our family. But there needs to be ingredients supplied there. But if I'm going to get that, those ingredients, I'm going to have to, first of all, back up and make sure that I get the foundation right. I know we live in a day and time where cooking is big. I mean, there's cooking channel. You know, food is almost worshipped nowadays. The Bible says their God is their belly. I think that's, we're getting close to that time. And people talk about, and, and there's new temples coming up all the time. Have you eaten at this restaurant? Have you paid your homage over there? Have you worshipped at this particular place? Oh, have you, not, have you not been there? Oh, you haven't been there. Okay. Boy, we just, we pop up and, and everything is all about food and, and doing, the, and we, we, we just love it. I'm that way. We enjoy those things. And, and, but I, and now we have cooking channels. I mean, people love watching cooking. I was talking to one person and, and their kid wants to get on the cook-off, the junior chef cook-off. You know, and they just love getting all these ingredients and chopping them all up and throwing this and searing that. And I just like to eat it. I don't like to do it. I'd burn water if it were up to me, man. I tell you what. I like to eat whatever you decide to fix. That would be all right with me. But uh, nonetheless, we, we, we love food. But, but, to, but to have a good food, you're going to need to have good ingredients. But to have, to have a good food, you want to get a cleaned off table and a clean kitchen. Well, I wouldn't want to eat in a dirty kitchen. We don't want to eat where cockroaches are everywhere or, or where uh, uh, there's just, it's, not, it's not been kept and clean. Well, he kind of backs up and says, now listen, if we're going to have a foundation of a good ingredient of a godly family and, and enhance our family relationships, number one, you need to be risen with Christ. You need to be saved. Risen means to be made alive. You must have eternal life. And that speaks of salvation. He says, ye then be risen with Christ. Number two, there not only need to be salvation, but he needs to be seeking. Seek those things which are above. Where Christ sits on the right hand of God, you're going to find out here, he's going to make Jesus the paramount pursuit. He's the focus. He said, first of all, you need to be saved. And then if you're saved, what are you seeking? What occupies your time? If we could, what to, well, I'll tell you what occupies your time is what occupies your thinking. Whatever occupies your thinking is going to be what you talk about. See, if I could record, and you could record my last 24 hours of conversation, I could record your last 24 hours of conversation, we would know what matters to us. Because we talk about things that are important to us. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So he says, now first of all, in this, in this, this process of producing a beautiful, a beautiful family, you need to be saved. 
Then, you had your focus on seeking those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. That's basically the kingdom of God. Life from God's perspective. The Bible tells us in John, Matthew chapter 6, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Now, many of us would not know the kingdom of God if it slapped us upside the face. We don't understand things from God's perspective. When a bad thing's happened to us, we think, who's responsible? Why did that happen? Why is this happening to me? We don't wonder what, what God is doing. Whenever the stock market goes south, we think, oh, it's the president. Where's the Congress? Where's the Senate? What's, what's going on? What's the Federal Reserve doing? We don't see what God might be doing. When someone gets elected that we don't really like, we might say, what? Our nation's going to hell in a handbasket. This is terrible. And certainly we can have opinions about that, and I probably agree with a lot of those things. At the same time, the Bible says that God setteth up one and putteth down another. He even sets up over kingdoms the basis of men. He says, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, as rivers of water return that whatsoever he will. He said that man's ways and the answer of the tongue are from him. He says, listen, in this preparation of your kitchen to produce a godly home, number one, make sure you're saved. By the way, it doesn't matter if I think you're saved or you think I'm saved. It doesn't matter how much you know about God. What you want to make sure is that God knows you. Make sure you're saved. If you're struggling with that, don't let pride and procrastination take you to the lake of fire. Get saved. Come to Jesus. Say, well, I'll do it later. You can't guarantee you'll be anywhere later. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what day to bring forth. And you can't even tell if you are here later that you will still feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit of God to respond to Him. Amen. The Bible says, my spirit will always strive with me. I'll get saved another day. When I feel, I'm not, not right now. Now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. But in this kitchen, we must, first of all, know we're saved. Number two, we must seek those things which are above. Seek the eternal. Seek to understand what's going on from God's perspective. And then we must set our affection on things Above, not on things on the earth. Look at verse number two, would you? Set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. Now, the word affection there is a Greek word that 19 other times in the Bible, in the New Testament, it is translated the mind. Set your mind on things that are eternal or thinking. Boy, I tell you what, sometimes when it comes to thinking, some people stop at nothing. <laughs> we don't think about anything. We can't even get still. If you get real quiet, it gets us all, all rattled. We've got to have the radio on, the CD player. We've got to have earbuds in. Just to sit and think is not something most of us do very often. Now, some are different than that, but I think it's important we learn to think. But the Bible says, now set your thinking on things that are above, not on things on the earth. Take a heavenly perspective about things. What is God doing? What's the purpose of this? What can I learn from this? What is the spiritual application of these situations? Not in things on the earth. And then the next verse, verse number four, it says, When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall we also appear with him in glory. Once again, he's bringing, verse number three, for you're dead and your life is here with Christ in God. Once again, Christ has become preeminent. That's their problem. Christ is not on the radar. He said, let me bring Christ back on. And by the way, it says, Christ who is our what? Life. That means he needs to be our whole purpose for existence. Some people have strife as their life. They just, they can't find a fight they don't want to be involved with. I mean, they are just drama mamas. They're trying to find some kind of thing all the time. Strife and argument. Strife has become their life. You know people like that. Where it just seems like there's nothing, nothing's good. It's always negative. It's always why. How come this hasn't happened? Why am I like this? Why isn't this coming? And it's all accusations from, against God and others. The Bible says, listen, when Christ is your life, then shall you also appear with Him in glory. Make Him your focus. Then he goes on to say, and mortify. 
Mortify is a Bible term for put to death or to slay, to kill. Morticians, you get the, someone who deals with dead people. A mortuary. He's using a strong term here. He says, first of all, make sure your salvation's set. Make your, sure that you're seeking things that are eternal. Set your thinking and your mind and your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. And then be sure that Christ is your focus. Stay focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says in verse number 5, Slay or mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. He said, there's some things You've got to get rid of it. By the way, if someone's cooking in the kitchen, you want to get rid, you want to take some cleaners and you want to kill germs. You can't have a nice meal if you if, if you've got a dirty, nasty thing. Someone's going to get sick. Someone's got food poison. Unless you put to death some things. Usually you have antibacterial Lysol or you've got some kind of a, a cleaner that you clean things with. Well, if you're going to have a great if you're, going to have a, if you're going to have a great uh, family, you're going to have to put to death some things. Now, God lists four sins that need to be put to death in the Christian home and in the church home. Four things you've got to go for the juggler on. You don't want to mess around with these four things. These are like the cockroaches in your kitchen. These are like the rats that scurry around, around, the, around the, the, the baseboard. You, got to, you, don't want to just, you don't want to share the kitchen with them. You gotta put, you gotta go for the jug. You can't just keep little pet animals around. You can't, you don't, you don't, if you see that, you it ought to bother you. He said, I want you to put to death, mortify, get rid of, before you start building a home that will honor the Lord Jesus Christ and add in the ingredients that will make a good home. You gotta deal with these things. Look at what the, what the Bible says, number number five, verse five. Read it with me, would you please? From it in its entirety. Ready? Mortify, therefore. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness with his idolatry. Actually, there are five things there. He says, first of all, you want to deal with fornication. You want to go for the juggler on immorality, immorality, sen sexual sins, you better go for it. This is the word of pornographic. Things that have to do with, with immorality. He says, you better deal with that. Now, in a society... They flood you with it. Years ago, you had to hunt and find for an for a immoral magazine. Now it's right on the click of your phone. You just look on it right quick. You can find it on your television. You can find it on your cable. You can find it on regular television. You can find provocative things. And here the Bible says, deal with fornication. Go for the juggler. Mortify it. Slay it. Kill it. You'll never have the home God wants you to have. And you'll never be prepared for the home as long as you have Fornication, as, a, as, a, as a, you can't coexist with that. Secondly, he says, the sin of uncleanness. And that is any kind of sensual sin. Any kind of uncleanness, any kind of perverse talk, sensual innuendos and things of that nature. You got a gutter mouth, you got a gutter mind. Any uncleanness, deal with that. Then he says, inordinate affection. And that is basically immoral. That is, that's sexual. that is a homosexual. It's not normal. It's an order. It's not ordered. God said in the middle, in the beginning, he made them male and female. That is God's order. Anything apart from that, male and male, female and female, is inordinate. It's not ordered. It's not together. It's not the way God designed it. So in that inordinate affection, it's not ordered. An affection between a, a, a father and a, and a, and a child, and a, a, a man and a, and a child, that's inordinate. The molestation there, that's, that's not order. That's, that's not right. It's sickening. It's repulsive. Anything that's inordinate, it, it, by the way, any kind, if you're married and you have affection toward another person who's not your husband or wife, that's inordinate. It's not ordered. And you have to deal with that affection. Had a sweet person re recently just say to me, well, why did God give me feelings if he doesn't want me to, to enact on them? Listen, friend, uh, if you run by your feelings, you'll be a disaster. You'll never do your laundry. You never wash your dishes. You won't get out of bed and go to work. Listen, feelings are real. Emotions are real. 
but they're never a leader. They're always to slay, and faith must be your horse. It must, it must, it's your tractor trailer is faith, and your, and your, and your trailer is, is, is your feelings. That's what we do, what God wants us to do, then feelings will catch up. With that thing, uh, God made us a, a trichotomy, a three-part being, spirit, soul, and body. Okay, just like God is a God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God the Father is the soul. God the Spirit, of Christ, Holy Spirit is the spirit, obviously. And the, the Lord Jesus is referred to as the body, the physical. Well, God did the same. That's why Jesus said, I do all those, always those things that please the Father. Just like my body does what my, my soul tells it to do. I put my arm up. It's because the headquarters of me, which you can't see, you just see my body, told my hand up. So my soul is that, it's that head, it's the computer of my life. But the spirit, filled life is the spirit tells the soul what to do, and the soul tells the body what to do. That's why the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, in talking about immorality, he says, he says this, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple, the Holy Spirit of God, which you have of God, and you're not your own? You are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your spirit and in your body, your body and your spirit, which are God. So God owns ownership of your spirit and your body, but it seems to be like your headquarters, that's who you're going to yield yourself to. And boy, you, if you let the soul make the decisions, you're, going to, you're, you're going down a, a detrimental path. That's why we need to be walking the, it doesn't say walk in the soul, walk in the spirit. Amen. And you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Well, he says, listen, you're going to have to mortify fornication. You mortify anything that's unclean morally. You, you put to death any affections that are not ordered by God. So anything that is not in God's order for the home, you've got to put to death. Go for the juggler. Deal with those. Don't excuse yourself. Don't say, well, I have needs. I can't take it. You can do anything God wants you to do. Operate in a, in a holy matter. And then the next thing the Bible says, not, and, and if evil concupiscence. And once again, we've talked about concupiscence before, but it's creating desires for things forbidden. It's creating flirtatious, provocative stimulus for things that you cannot do rightfully. He said, now listen, if you're going to have the home, where you're going to enjoy the blessings of God. And you're going to make, a, you're going to make the, the cake, if you will, of a godly home. And you're going to add these ingredients in a moment that I'm going to share with you from the Word of God or that God will share with us together. He says, you're going to have to keep a clean kitchen. You're going to have to deal with fornication and deal with it strongly. Any uncleanness, do not give yourself an excuse for that. Anything that's in order and affection that goes against God's nature and His commands, deal with them. And do not create evil concupiscence. Create, that's why television watching, many of the shows are created to create desires for things you cannot rightfully fulfill. And then He changes it and goes, and covetousness with is idolatry. Now he kind of leads this to the itch for more, that desire for more stuff and more things and desires become, become uh, they become our focus, which God says that's like idolatry, worshiping idols. Oh, I want to get that. I want that. And we want something, whatever it might be. Maybe it's a different stature. Maybe, it is a, maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's money, maybe it's a car, maybe it's a career, whatever it is, but that becomes our focus. He says, and don't go to covetousness, that's idolatry. These are things that God tells us. The first word in, in verse 5 is what, folks? Say it with me, would you? It is? That means to put to death, to slay it. So when those things come, you don't want to play with immorality. 
Matter of fact, Solomon he told his son, he said, there's that lady's house, the strange woman. Don't walk past her door. Don't go near her corner. The prudent man foreseeth evil and he hides himself. But the simple pass on and they're punished. They get dealt with. He says, so when it comes to these sins, you've got to rid your kitchen of these sins. These are serious. And they have complicated our homes. They've complicated this church. They've complicated every church. They complicate a community. They complicate a civilization. They complicate America. They complicate our city. Anytime there's immorality, it always breeds tremendous complications. Thank God for the grace of God. Verse number 6, the Bible says, For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. He said, look, if you don't want to deal with those sins, you can either rid yourself of them, wash them from your kitchen, or experience the wrath of God upon your life. He said, this is the stuff that God's wrath begins to, begins to unleash on. So, Pastor, you really believe that? Ask Sodom and Gomorrah. God's wrath, finally, he said, enough is enough. And wrath, and by the way, it's going to happen to your life, my life, and you can't handle the wrath of God, friend. If you think for a moment, I'm big enough, I'm tough enough, I can do what I want, I'll take my medicine. Oh, you don't want to take the wrath of God. The wrath of God cometh upon anyone who disobeys God's orders. Verse number 7, look at that please. In the which ye also walked sometimes when you lived in them. But now, he said, but when you were unsaved, this is what unsaved people do. Unsaved people, they live immorally. Unsaved people talk dirty jokes. They watch wrong things. That's what people who don't know Jesus do. He said, they, they do create desires for things forbidden. They do uh, entertain that homosexuality is okay. It's okay. They do live a life of covetousness. Just get more, get more, get more. Enough is not enough. He said, now that's how we all walk when we didn't know Jesus. He says, but now, verse number 8, put off all these. And he's going to go to another list. Now, I'm going to take a few moments to go through this list, and then we'll close this morning with this thought. He says, look, you, you, you've put to death this. These things have got to go. There's no negotiation on fornication. There's no negotiation on cleanness. There's no negotiation. Don't even talk about it. Covetousness. Deal with it. In order to, in, in evil concupiscence, get rid of those things that would provoke you to do things that are wrong. Those put to death. He said, now, beyond that, because that'll, that'll get the wrath of God all over you. And that's how unsaved people do. But he said, beyond that, put off these things. Now, those are kind of the rank sins. These are relationship sins. Look at, look at them. Look at the list. It's a, it's, it really is, it gets down where we live. Now, you also should put off all these. What else? What's the things you should put off? Number one, anger. He said, deal with anger. You know, if I said this morning... And, and I'm not, and please don't raise your hand. But if I said, how many have had a terrible, immoral thought this week? Raise your hand. Well, most of us, good night. I'm not going to do that. How many have lost their temper recently? Raise your hand. Most all of us. We kind of put this on a different shelf, but God brings it right there and says, hey, listen, if you want to have a clean kitchen, you want to make a beautiful home, you're going to have to deal with anger. Put off anger like a bad habit. Wrath, that's the intent to hurt. Malice. And by the way, it's progressive. It's like, man, it makes me mad. Even I mean, if I had that guy punch him enough, then, then the intent to hurt him. Malice, to complicate someone else's life because the anger is just not satisfied. Then he says, put off blasphemy. Filthy communication out of your mouth. By the way, watch out when anger is upset. Your brain goes in neutral. Your mouth goes in dry. And you start saying things, profanity, blasphemous things, all because, well, I said it because, because I was mad. Man, you got me all fired up. And you think that doesn't have some consequences. It causes all kinds of issues in the home. Many of us, long after 
physical bruises that we got on the playground go away as little children. The words our parents said to us and other people said, you're stupid, you're dumb, you'll never mount anything, they still run in our Rolodex all the time. They come up continually. She said, now, in a home, deal with anger. Deal with wrath and malice and, and then watch your mouth. Watch your mouth and don't let filthy communication come out of your mouth. Then verse number 9, lie not one to another. Be truthful. Seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him. Who do you think the him is there? Jesus, that created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond or free, but Christ is all in all. There are things we must slay, there are things we must shed, and then we must share the person of Christ. The Christ is all in all. Dear friends, I want to have a good family. I want to be a good family member for you. I will get to know you as, as First Baptist Church members better than I'll know my own family. We're all spread apart to different states and different places. But I want to be a good family member. I'll tell you one thing that will help me be a better family member and make you a better family member is if we seriously, uh, first of all, we're saved. Then we seek eternal things. And we set our thinking on things that are above, not on things on the earth. And we remember that things are about the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we slay immoral talking, actions, covetousness. And we shed any anger and wrath and malice from our lives. And any filthy things that we would say or any lies that we would not be truthful about, we deal with those things. And we bring back our focus to the person of Christ who is our all in all. If there's anything we need to do today, we ought to say, Lord Jesus, get back on the radar of my life. Let me make you preeminent. That would fix so many marriage problems. That would fix so many rebellious young people if Jesus were preeminent. If he's on the radar, may God help us. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the attention of your people as we walk through 11 verses of the Bible. Thank you for the truths that are there. I pray that you would have liberty to walk the halls of my heart. Convict me of sin that, Lord, is, that would hurt me. Help me to put to death things and shed other things, put away things in, in more of a continuous working pattern. I pray that, Lord, you would help us to have homes that would be beautiful, and godly, and holy, and righteous in every way. With heads bowed and eyes,